Somewhere along the line, we lost sight of who it was that we were. Somewhere along the line, we have, we became reflections of the people that we were policing. Christ's sake, I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a thief. I'm a policeman. How the hell did this happen? There is a line that transcends our society which functions as a dividing line between order and anarchy. That line is the law. The cop has been entrusted by the public to maintain that line. Once a cop becomes corrupt and has used that public trust for his own personal gain, this corruption affects the very fiber of our society. And the moral erosion within our society can be irreversible. We are about to examine the causes of police corruption and its effect on the life of corrupt cops, their family, their department, and the community in which they serve. New York, with its grandeur and diversity, has also been a center over the years for major police corruption. The Bob Lucy story establishes and articulates a perspective of the evolution, the inner workings, and the guilt and pain associated with police corruption. There's, there's a certain understanding of, of life on a day-by-day -day basis, understanding, knowing, knowing what it is that what you've gone through and where you, how you've gotten to the position you're in. But when you meet, so, somehow go to, off to work one day and then come home and deliver this bomb, say, uh, there's a possibility I'm going to be arrested. And then to see the expression on the family's face, what do you mean you're going to be, how can you be arrested? I mean, how does that, you're a policeman. I mean, how does that happen? What, is, what, what have you done? And so all this, all, all the structure, all the uh, process of building up, uh, of, of constructing this face that I was describing, is, uh, is shattered. Robert Lucy was born and raised in Queens, New York, was married with two kids, and became a detective with the New York City Police Department. As a member of the elite special investigative unit of the New York Police Department, Lucy developed a reputation for being a top cop but at the same time, along with his other associates, was taking part in numerous illegal activities. Bob Lucy's story was depicted in both the book and feature film, Prince of the City. Lucy has many stories to tell about his experience as a corrupt cop. On one occasion, while a drug raid was going on in a building, Lucy waited outside on the radio. Suddenly, he found himself with a lot of money in his hands. In any event, I get, a call, I get a call after they were in a, in a place searching for a while uh, to meet a couple of them outside, and they said that they found a, a hat box with some money in it. So one of the detectives said to me, uh, you're going to be out front here. I said, yeah. He said, well, you walk past the front of the building in exactly 90 seconds and look up. I said, OK. So I. I was across the street and I had my car, I had my car parked across the street from this place. And I walked across the street in exactly 90 seconds. I looked up and this thing came flying out of the window. And I caught it. I walked over to my car, never looking into it. And I opened the trunk of the car and I threw it in. And there was a black kid standing on the street in front of this place. He had his hands on his hips. And he was looking out at the window and he looked over at me. And he said, what you up to? <laughs> yeah, because he saw cops running, coming and going from that place. But it was a, an unbelievable story of um, detectives who were among the very best in the police department at solving crime, among the very best at catching drug dealers, brave, tough, uh, vast majority, not all, but vast majority who started off with absolutely the right motivations, uh, going after drug dealers, hated drugs, hated criminals, um, kind of all deteriorated. They started first by taking money, and then when there wasn't money in certain deals or there wasn't money in certain uh, situations where they were making arrests, they'd substitute the drugs for the money and then sell the drugs through their informants. And they had developed an elaborate web of rationalizations for why this was okay. Goodness and evil is clearly defined. I mean, it's not, it's not so complicated. I mean, we can make it complicated if you like it to be. If you want it to be complicated, you want to rationalize your behavior, you can do that. But the truth of the matter is that evil has a face, and you can recognize that face as soon as you look at it, and you hear it, you know it, you know it. As Soon as someone starts talking about it, as soon as the opportunity presents itself, a voice explodes in the back of your head and says, this is wrong, period. 
And then what we do is suppress that voice. You know, we suppress it, it's like, shut up. <laughs> I want to listen, I want to rationalize this. I want to understand this, you know, there's more to be said here. Something specific will happen to give you, you know, the opportunity to like, okay, now here's your opportunity. Are you going to be part of this or you're not going to be part of this? In one case, Lucy found himself in a position where money was hard to turn down when he and other New York cops were confronted with two Cuban drug dealers and a lot of money. And then someone opens, the, gets the keys to the car and opens the trunk of the car. And all I can hear is, holy shit. Someone goes, wow. Now, I push my way in and I, I look in the trunk of this car and all these paper, they're paper bags and they're, people are throwing these paper bags over and there are rolls of money in the car. You know, about the size of your fist wrapped with red, rub, red rubber bands. The most money I'd ever seen in my life was when I cashed my check payday and it fit neatly in my shirt pocket, you know? Barely made a bulge. And I'm looking at all this money. And everyone's looking at it and people are going, holy mackerel, you know, looking at it. Cuban guy who had, didn't speak a word of English, when we handcuffed him, put him in, steps out, lieutenant grabs him, pulls him out and says, where'd you get all this money? He looks in the trunk of the car and says, man, he says, that must be counterfeit. Because that ain't my money. I don't know who belongs to that money. It's not mine. And whoever it belongs to, he ain't here to say it's his. It's not mine. So if he ain't here and it's not mine, it must be yours. And he laughs. So Tennant said, well, listen, I don't do anything unless it's unanimous. And someone asked, what's the question? Do you know? He said, well, I don't do anything here. We have a car full of money. We find no drugs. We find no guns. We don't find anything. We don't find anything. And... Uh, what, what are we supposed to do? So what we do then, he says, we turn it over to the city, you see. We send, you know, we, we seize all this money, we spend two or three days counting it and all sorts of shit, invoicing it, vouchering it. We turn it all over to the city. The city takes the money, do you understand? And they give it to welfare, do you understand? Some asshole in welfare goes out, buys a gun and kills a cop. Now you want to be responsible for killing a cop, you call welfare, you call the city. So I'm not killing no cops. I said, no, forget it. Cuban guy then steps out and says, uh, I got an idea, guys. Now he speaks perfect English. That had barely an accent. He said, I got an idea. He said, uh, here's the deal. He said, why don't you guys take half this money and let us go back to Florida? And I swear to God, we'll never come back to New York. Tennant says, you swear to God? He said, yeah, I swear to God. He said, Whew. He said, listen, I don't know about you guys, but as far as I'm concerned, I know these Cubans are very religious people. And if this guy swears to God, that's good enough for me. You begin to rationalize this whole business that this is a great big game and no one really cares. And that you, you know, on this, you know, on, on this whole structure, in this whole structure of things, you're certainly the lowest rung of this ladder because you're the, you know, people treat you as though you're the least intelligent. You certainly don't understand, you know, you're not terribly sophisticated. You're a cop. So now you're in the situation. Now, how do I get out of the situation? You know, I'm frightened. This is going to happen or that. Well, you, you, you know, it's no more frightening getting out as it should have been getting in. And you, and you step out. It's as simple as that. Because of his guilt, Lucy went through a metamorphosis and agreed to participate in a federal investigation of police corruption within the New York Police Department. For two years, he wore a wire and later testified in trials against his fellow police officers. I think it was like 52 cases emerged from that, from that one, from Bob's, um, from Bob's statements alone. The value of it was immeasurable to New York City and the New York City Police Department because it changed um, a system of corruption. I mean, the fact of the matter is, people say, well, you know, I've had a guy who was a police commissioner, a police commissioner of a big city, tell me, the best cops he knew were the most corrupt cops. Now, he wanted to explain that to me. Yeah, well, he didn't have to explain it to me, but he was going to try to explain that on a television show that we both were going to go on. And I said to him, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you know, the toughest, the best cops I knew were the most corrupt, because they're the closest to the street. Said, well, you know, you want to know something, pal? You don't need those guys as cops. You may think they're the best cops, because they talk the best baloney. You know, but they're not cops. There's some, there's some, some, there's some form of creature that exists in that, you know, the dark space between cops and bad guys. They're not cops or agents or whatever they are. Do you know? Who 
corruption investigation is difficult to detect and extremely complex and sensitive because the causes of corruption are broad and the cops that are investigating are investigating their own. Internal Affairs Division, Lieutenant Morinelli. The cops on the street, and particularly corrupt cops, have different ways to refer to internal affairs. Some cops, especially ones who get arrested, might tell you that uh, the people that investigate corruption in police departments, they call them ginks and they call them by, by various other names. It was, you know, watch uh, none of the ginks follow you home at night. Yeah, well, the shoe fly was like the uh, most common pet name. Yeah, shoe flying. I'm not even sure what that means. We got wind of the Ethics Accountability Unit was investigating five squad. This is why we were still in working order. And they were up at the uh, arsenal up in the Northeast. And we were trying to devise a way to get into their offices at night to go through their files to see if they had anything on anybody in our squad. We never did, but it was talked about within the narcotic unit. There are various philosophies and techniques utilized in police corruption investigations. You aggressively pursue the rogue bad cop. And you can do that through, th through several ways. You've got to use innovative investigative techniques. Uh, you have to create situations out there, checks and balances, such as integrity tests. Oftentimes it's done by an internal affairs situation where you will create a situation to place an officer in a, you might say, a tempting situation and to see if he's tempted. Uh, you may call him to a scene where something's available to be taken with maybe nobody looking. And uh, you see if he's, he's, he's taken that. That's, that's a big step to do that. Is it effective? Yeah, it's effective in two ways. One way is, is that you may get a corrupt officer off the street. Uh, another way that it's effective is that if the officer thinks that integrity tests are being conducted, they will at least, at least think twice if they come upon a real situation where that's there. The main technique is, is, uh, is to develop informants, uh, to develop cooperating witnesses, uh, flip individuals who may be lower level participants in the conspiracies, and uh, use them to develop the kind of evidence necessary to convict in a corrupt, corruption case the use of videotapes. I mean, juries almost demand videotapes when you're going to accuse a cop of corruption or, or audio tapes. Corrupt cops are sensitized to wiretaps and other sophisticated surveillance equipment. Never talk on the phone. You know, that was a, the FBI had a real struggle trying to get anything on the phone. I didn't get anything on the phone actually with anybody. I mean, they even had our phones tapped at the unit. And uh, because there was, there was always a tape on the bottom of the phone. You know, a little message, uh, remember this is a three-way conversation, meaning that the phones were tapped, you know, or they could be tapped. We keep abreast of the most advanced electronic uh, surveillance equipment, and um, we uh, update our equipment constantly to, to, uh, uh, to improve it. Uh, we have people who are experts, they're trained annually uh, on all of the latest uh, techniques. Uh, this is some of the equipment. There's a there's sort of a pecking order of equipment uh, and it works its way into the, uh, into the police ranks in that, in that order. CIA has the most advanced equipment. It's usually, um, it's usually kept under wraps, it's secure for a good period of time. And then when it, when it becomes obsolete for their purposes, it moves, that's the equipment that you find later on in, in, in law enforcement. So we try to get it uh, uh, at the best, we try to get at the best equipment right after it becomes obsolete by CIA. Internal affairs investigations utilize sophisticated techniques to videotape and record corrupt police activity. One such technique might be a van on the street. This we call our super van. It's, it's a self-contained surveillance van that is used during the course of a confidential police investigation. Uh, it is completely self-contained. It is heated, it is air conditioned, it has a, a refrigerator, it has toilet facilities. It has stabilizers which provide the van with the stability when people are in here not to be rocking when they're moving about. Uh, we have a great deal of electronic equipment in here. We have a video copy processor that is actually hooked to our periscope and we have the ability to 
either record through video or through still camera uh, with our periscope as well. We're not allowed to film the outside of the van because it's used for secret investigations. Police corruption is such a significant crime that all levels of government, the city, the state, and the federal government can be involved in its investigation without one governmental entity not necessarily knowing the other is involved. Where you suspect there's corruption uh, in a police department or anywhere else in a community, uh, it's unlikely you're going to uh, be working with uh, uh, me members of that community during the course of your investigation because you must keep, uh, you must keep secrecy in those cases. Uh, the potential for leaks increases when you have uh, that kind of a problem. Uh, so we, we work very closely with ourselves and no one else. You have checks and balances with other agencies, whether it's the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI or District Attorney's Office, um, where if there is corruption, the public has various avenues to go to. Uh, if they don't trust the police department, they can go to the DA. Or if they don't trust the police department and the DA, they can go to the U.S. Attorney or the State Attorney General. If the other agencies believe that the administration of the department is sincere about keeping the department clean and, and trying to battle corruption. It's not going to be a them and us mentality. They're going to work together. Uh, we offer our services to any police department that identifies a problem within the department or whatever as far as a, a serious corruption problem. We're not the internal affairs for police departments. We are not the police of the police. But we, as members of the law enforcement enforcement community worked hand in hand, work hand in hand with various police departments and trying to address the most serious corruption problems. Uh, we have certain areas of expertise. Uh, we have gone to state and local departments to ask for their opinion on things as to how to address certain issues. Uh, so we work together. More often than not, if we receive allegations against a state or local or other federal agency law enforcement officer, we refer that allegation to that agency because the norm, the standard is, is that agencies clean up their own or take care of their own problems. The fundamental causes of corruption within a police department reflect the general decay of values within our society. Most police officers go, go into the profession uh, not corrupt, but with a, a, you know, a fervent desire uh, to catch the bad guy, uh, to do the right thing. And it's a gradual occurrence. It may start with... Uh, uh, a superior officer telling them to ignore uh, uh, a responsibility, ignore, don't give this guy a ticket, or you know, maybe you don't have to be so hard. It may start at that level, and, and over time, as they, as they get more frustrated and are more tempted, uh, uh, they fall prey to uh, one of those temptations. Yeah, the, the, the corruption started uh, early on, uh, from the first day on the street, but it progressed, you know, like, uh, you know, it started with the f sergeant giving you a five-hour note at roll call, a five-hour bill, and so he used to call a note, you know, and uh, they'd, give it, they'd give you a five-hour uh, to protect the bar room or let them run a little late or stuff like that or, uh, you know, protect the number writer on your sector there. And uh, that was pretty much the way it went uh, for a while. And then I got into Vice, and the Vice, there was a bag man, and he handed me something, you know, an envelope every month with a couple hundred dollars in it. And like, I didn't really, I mean, we used it to, to spend at the bar or something or, you know, gamble with or something. You know, it wasn't really uh, something you get rich on, you know. But again, it was, it was acceptable within that system. So I guess that's how I justified it. You know, like, it's okay, everybody's doing it here. These are just some of the rationalizations that, that some of these guys go through on the, on the street. And then on the other hand, you know, you, got, you can't forget the bribe ores, that if it weren't for two, people involved, it wouldn't occur. In the simplest terms, if you have a, a guy doing a traffic, somebody violating traffic violations and the officer asks for your 
driver's license and you attach a $20 or $50 bill to it. Yeah. Maybe he's not asking for anything. Who's the bad guy? Probably both of them. But who started it? So the public, sometimes they get what they pay for, or they get exactly what they expect. When leadership is weak in a police department, that's precisely uh, when you're going to have more corruption, more brutality, uh, situations that are more out of control. Most law enforcement officers desire the respect of their superiors, and it's necessary for them to respect their superiors. And oftentimes you'll see a cop go bad when he loses it, as soon as he loses that respect. Because uh, that's another excuse. You know, he's being tempted, he's being tempted, he's being tempted, and he's trying to rationalize what he's about to do. And sometimes that rationalization will include, well, you know, the bosses here, they don't know what they're doing. You know, they don't care anymore, and, uh, you know, they're getting their share, or they're getting this and they're getting that, I'm going to get my share. Another thing that's linked very closely with law enforcement corruption is judicial corruption uh, and corruption on the prosecutive side of the house. If a law enforcement officer works and works and works to make a case and he sees that the case goes nowhere because he finds out that the judge is taking money or the judge is doing it as a favor to a political buddy or that the prosecutor's taking money or, is, or the prosecutor's doing it as a political favor, then the next time, maybe that cop will think, or that law enforcement officer will think, why should I waste my time? If they're getting the money two rungs up the ladder, I'm gonna take it here. The lawyers would say, oh, Charlie, I need a win today. You know, I need, you know, I need this guy out, you know? So you go in and tell the DA that, uh, you know, the guy's helping you, you know, he's giving you some information or something. And you get him off, you know? Um, then he owes you one, maybe a lawyer, finds out that one of his clients is dealing dope again and he needs another case so he he gives you information people would be shocked my lawyer gave you information you know if you ever said something like that you know if you worked in a homicide squad and you had great information about narcotics you're not going to give it to anyone in narcotics because you think they'll sell it and if you're in a narcotics unit and you want to give some information to the homicide squad you're not going to give it to them because they'll sell your information and that happened when I was in the police department. It happened all the time. You wouldn't give no one information because if you gave it to them, they'd sell your case out. I had one wiretap that was sold four times. Any one of those people along the line can sell that information to organized crime, and they do it on a regular basis. Some would say that the quagmire within our judicial system is only one level of difficulty within our society. Even more significant is the moral decay of social values and the issue of drugs in the streets of America today. To the extent that our society is, uh, uh, is, has a deteriorating ethical foundation, uh, and, and I am one who happens to believe our society is deteriorating in that regard, then one naturally assumes that you're going to have more corruption because there's less of an uh, internal mechanism to, to compel people to do otherwise. Drugs are a big player in that issue that since drugs have become so prevalent in the criminal community and the money's so big, that escalates that temptation. When instead of maybe 30 years ago, you were talking about $10,000, which was a lot of money, now you may be talking about a million dollars or $2 million. And for those people that, those few people that have a price, maybe that's at their price or beyond it. Uh, at that point, it was, uh us against the drug dealers. They don't deserve to have the money. We do. We're the ones that, you know, put our life on the line, that locked them up. The courts let them out of jail. Very few drug dealers go to jail. They did at that time. They didn't at that time. Uh, and we, I knew there was something wrong with it, that it was wrong. Uh, but it made life easier. What is the extent and the type of police corruption in today's society? Is there law enforcement corruption? Yeah. Is it in every level of law enforcement agency, federal, state, local, from the largest departments to the small departments? Yeah, every one of them are touched. If you're in uh, 
small town USA and you've got a chief of police and an assistant chief of police and that's your police department uh, is there a possibility that one of them's corrupt yeah is it likely no on a percentage basis it's highly unlikely uh, but could it could any community be touched by this absolutely what you have is a small group of officers or a single officer that sees upon an opportunity and then maybe after they seize upon one opportunity that's presented to them, maybe they'll create the next opportunity. Uh, and then they're creating several opportunities. Then you have that small group or single officer that's completely out of control. What you have are individual cases of police criminality, where cops are more involved in real criminal activity, selling drugs, guarding drug dealers, riding shotgun for drug deals, committing hits, <laughs> I mean, doing stick-ups, I mean, doing amazing things. I didn't feel guilty about taking the money, uh, but I did feel guilty when we got involved in those circumstances where we would take the drugs and it would be given to a drug dealer. Yes, that I did. That, I should have had the backbone to stick up and say, no, we're not going to do that, because that did bother me. And, and so, we, I guess, we thought we were above the law in a lot of ways. You know, being the law, but given a lot of power, probably too much power. But it's so contradictory. You, the, you're trying to take the drugs off the street, yet it was so corrupt, you're putting it right back on the street again. When you get involved in drug-related co corruption, you are involved. Uh, you are into it then, and there's usually no way to get out uh, because there's too much money. And you get a police officer or a law enforcement officer, and he's taken drug money, uh, he may be making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year as a law enforcement officer, uh, and now all of a sudden he shows up with five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. It makes a man do desperate things. He's got to cover the money, he's got to explain the money, and then, then he gets into money laundering, and then he figures out he's pretty good at what he does, and then you may find that he's running a drug organization himself. Drug dealing by cops is one level of corruption, but so is the issue of drug abuse by cops. You know, like grabbing, you know, you hit a place and there's a couple pounds of cocaine, you know, maybe cutting a pound out and putting some cut in there and making it two pounds again, you know, and keeping a pound for yourself or the other guys or whatever, you know, whatever you're going to do with it, give it to informants or whatever, or use it. I mean, there are all kinds of things that happen. Uh, to someone who is addicted to narcotics, and uh, they'll do anything for, for the money. They're, cops are no different than anybody else. Uh, and where they go, wherever their source of money is, they may steal money from an evidence uh, uh, locker uh, in order to pay for it. Uh, they may steal money from, uh, from uh, people they stop on the road for tickets in order, to, in order to do that. All kinds of things can happen. The November before the April 26th I was arrested, I. I couldn't beat the mailman home anymore. I, I was just too, too far in debt. Uh, I'd be writing checks for cocaine, marijuana, cashing uh, my, my visa card, getting cash advances from the bank, writing home equity checks on my house just to get the drug. It's a new culture. I mean, it's a culture that grew up in a, it's a very much drug-oriented culture. And there's a re revitalization and rebirth of heroin, which is, you know, this horrible epidemic-producing drug. So you have a lot more police who are experimenting and playing with drugs before they became policemen, do you know? And that were now, you know, active policemen and, and out in the street. You know, cocaine is not a, something that, uh, that's any great, strange, sort of uh, alien thing to them. It's something they've been around from the time they were in high school, grammar school, some of them. So the use of drugs and the abuse of drugs is something to really be concerned about nowadays. But the pressures on modern police officers are much, much worse because we're talking about a much larger drug trade now. But the temptation, when you see that cash, you realize how great the temptation is. Here are people who are putting their lives at risk. Here are people whose um, contributions are unappreciated. And um, very often they're not supported by political uh, administrations. All of, the, all of the criteria for alienation 
and a human being. And still, they're able to operate honestly. When police corruption occurs, it causes a ripple effect. It touches the police officer, the officer's family, the legal system, the police department, and the citizens within the community. Your world ends, okay? You say to yourself, you know, I'm a certain image, you know, and, uh, you know, what, 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 are, what are people going to think of me? What are my family going to think of me? The mother and father are really proud of Officer so-and-so because he's a member of the police department. All of a sudden, it turns out that Officer so-and-so is arrested and alleged to be stealing money or to selling drugs. The uh, contradiction with regard to the public perception and even the, in, the, the way in which a person carries themselves is so tremendous that it um, has much more devastating effect on personality. Corrupt cops only realize the effect of their corruption when they are arrested. There is always this view of somebody being let out in handcuffs, jacket over its head, <coughs> neighbors running for their instamatics when they take you out of the house. Probably turning my badge in and resigning. That was pretty difficult for me. The reality of headlines, television news stories, and trials related to the corruption bring the effect of corruption home for the first time. Policemen are always high profile. Police cases are always high profile and get a lot of media attention. And to have my picture and my name splashed across the front page of the newspaper was horrible. And to have the neighbors read it. And, and you do think to yourself, well, I wonder what they think. They wouldn't say anything. They would come out, oh, we wish you luck and stuff like that. But do they really mean it? The effect of the corruption on close family members as well as friends strikes a blow to the inner human spirit. I was on a pedestal to them. You know, when I sat down and I told him, it was probably the hardest thing I ever did in my life, you know. When I told him that I used, you know, I had, I had, had used some drugs in there, and then, um, you know, I was involved with this corruption and sort of explained what I was involved with. And, um, you know, in a real honest way, this, uh, I didn't want to lie to him anymore. The effect on a cop when saying goodbye to his family before going to prison is overwhelming. They all came out of their house, and everybody was crying. I was crying. They were crying. Unbelievable. I mean, that's why I hope somebody gets something out of this, to put theirself in my place and to have to kiss your kids goodbye and know that you're not going to see them. And the, the sorrow on my face and the kids' face, it's, I, I don't even like to think about it. The effect on a cop being sent to prison is shattering. Just guilt and shame. I mean, you're a, you're a criminal. You're a, you're a, you're sitting in jail and uh, and you're a criminal like a, like a, like everybody else, you know. And I never seen myself as a criminal. I mean, yeah, we're on the, I'm on the other side of the fence here. I'm not a criminal. Uh, but yet here I am with the same uniform on and uh, and doing the same things as they're doing. There is great personal pain associated with police corruption. And things started to go wrong at home. put my father in DeBoer Hospital for a uh, triple bypass. <laughs> my mother, she had one leg. My sister had cancer, and my brother Billy's mentally retarded. They all live in the same house right down the street. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, I did this to my family. I uh, finally realized I couldn't help them. So my dad died. Nine months later, my mom died. A year later, my sister died. Billy lives with me now. I take care of him. Sometimes I still blame myself. Because maybe if all this wasn't all spread out in the news or something, that none of this would have happened. It was sad. It's just a whole sad situation. But people don't realize that, you know. I mean, I want guys to realize that when they, when they, when they stick their hand out there, uh, they're, or they're out there doing things that I'm mentioning or I'm talking about, and they know what they're doing, um, that there's serious consequences behind it. 
You know, and if and if they ever do get caught or they lose their job or they get suspended or whatever, they're going to go through a, a tremendous amount of guilt, shame, and and uh, remorse and and pain. Uh, and they're putting their families through a whole bunch of things that they don't deserve. You know, and it's not right for them to go through that. You know, all because of what. You know, it's like I look back and I say, who wins and loses. You know. Who loses is the family. Nobody wins, you know? There's no winners. The cases a cop has been involved with fall apart after a cop has been arrested. The ripple effect of a police corruption case obviously goes beyond the crimes the officer himself commits to the extent that officer participated in other, uh, even legitimate arrests or search warrants uh, or prosecutions, those cases potentially become tainted because now you have a police officer who uh, is shown to be dishonest, who uh, may be a key witness in some other investigation. So uh, that's certainly a, a huge cost of corruption uh, where it exists. Mistrust and other bizarre behavior is an effect of corruption within a corrupt department. A lot of corrupt cops, they'll cheat each other. Uh, like if, if his share was supposed to be fifteen hundred dollars, he may find out later he only got five hundred. Okay, sometimes that'll cause him to turn on the other guy, you know, turn him in. Say he, he cheated me. If each individual officer on a particular job would get one or two thousand dollars each, the lieutenant might have gotten five hundred. He was supposed to get, and he told you that he wanted a fair shake, but we all stuck together as far as the policeman, and because he would question you. He would call you in two days after a certain arrest and, and, and you know, talk to you about it and say that was a pretty good job. Uh, how much did you get that night? You better remember, because if, if you really got $2,000 and we only gave him 500, you better remember to tell him $500. The effect of corruption on the rank and file within a department, as well as the integrity of the administration, can be beyond repair. Uh, the chiefs are uh, very sensitive uh, to that. Um, it is uh, the kind of thing they're very fearful of, um, uh, mainly because it's, a, it's not only an embarrassment, but when you have a corrupt officer in your ranks and you haven't discovered it yourself, uh, you know, you begin to look back at your own management style. So they're, they're very sensitive to corruption uh, by a member of their, uh, of their police force. The rank and file uh, does not accept corrupt, uh, as a whole, does not accept uh, the thought of a corrupt police officer. Uh, they, sh they, uh, they shun that officer uh, and basically, um, uh, you know, despise uh, the fact that one of their own uh, can be corrupt and trade his, uh, his or her badge for money. The effect of corruption on the community is the most damaging of all. Concerned citizens offer insights into the effect of corruption on the streets of America. It makes you a little bit untrustworthy, that you don't know if the cop is good, you don't know if the cop is not good, you don't know, is, did this cop have a little something before he came to work this morning? And it also makes you wonder who they're going to be protecting if they're into it. You don't know, are they protecting me or are they protecting the ones that are on the street selling the stuff? Everything a police department does in the criminal justice system is based on trust. What corruption does, it erodes the trust. It erodes the trust within the department, within the system, uh, with the public. Uh, this is also probably one of the reasons that people are uh, arming themselves uh, because they cannot trust the police. Usually happens in communities where um, things are very tough and where that it's very important to have that level of trust and confidence in the police department. So it's a double, you know, it's a double whammy in a way. Policemen don't work in a vacuum. And what's interesting about uh, ghetto life, for example, is that people in a ghetto know the police better than anyone else. They really know the police. They know, they, the police are there when they're born, the police are there when they die, the police are there to fix their plumbing, the police are there to fix their electricity. The police do everything in the ghettos. 
And the truth of the matter is that they have a sense of what the police world is really all about. So if, if police are out of control and are highly corrupt, you know, you can see that. There's no way of hiding it in, the, in place, especially in the inner city. You know, just, they just see it every day, and they lose all faith in their police. I try to teach my, my children that all police is not bad, but from what they see on television, reading papers about police, they're scared. I have a, the youngest one is 10. I think she would ask a stranger before she asked the police for help, because she's scared that maybe they might lock up or something, or they'll hit her. This is the type of um, environment that she sees. So I try to install on her that they're all not like that. Well, you know, until you post, I read it. And you know, I sometimes like, you never really have any comment. You just really sort of shake your head. You know, you don't really give it much thought. But then when you really think about it, you know, it's, it's pretty disgusting, you know, because then what does that say for the fact that, you know, you're trying to fight drugs, you're trying to fight crack, you're trying to get the kids off the street. So what is that telling them? You know, well, you know, cops can do it. So I can do it, who cares? You know, they're not gonna do anything about it. You know, I'm not gonna do any time, so it's okay. So in turn, you have people who are taking drugs, you have people who are selling drugs, and that's going to affect my life, my son, who's small, what's going to happen to him as he's growing up. And the police, by the way, are not unique when it comes to corruption. I mean, let's face it, they mirror those who are above them. If, if there's decency and honesty and integrity, a one step up and five steps up, and at the top of the line, they'll be honest and have integrity and perseverance. If you don't have credibility with the community, you might as well close your doors. Uh, you must be responsive to the community. Uh, you must establish liaison with everybody that you can so they can understand how you work. Neighborhood leaders from Philadelphia provide further insight on how police corruption results in the erosion of community trust and hurts the delivery of service. We as a community group are trying to help other people in the community put trust in this system. And if the system and the people who are carrying this out are not working, you know, it makes a joke of everything that people are trying to do to improve the community. It makes a joke of what you're trying to do as far as getting people to trust the police and believe in them. As people get into community policing and understand that officers are people, and we need to weed out those who cannot do the job. And I think that's going to be the hardest process. Six to, please tell us 60 to 70 percent of all narcotics in Philadelphia come through this North Philadelphia area, East Division. Yeah. How does it do that without somebody helping it? <laughs> that's the 2200 block of Palesworth Street. For 20 some years, that was one of the biggest areas where heroin was sold in this, in this city. And, you know, <laughs> we have city officials telling us, oh yeah, we've known that's where you get your best quality of heroin for over 20 years. Well, first of all, you know, you tell me there's no city policy of containment of drugs in North Philadelphia, yet you tell me you've known this for 20 years and you haven't done anything about it. Part of that was the police that were involved, that were taking the payoffs and part of the shakedown and what have you. Every time there's an article in the newspaper about police corruption, it has devastating ripples inside the police high command. Because the police high command has got the message, corruption is something that has to be rooted out. But what their reaction is to get conservative, and they, they withdraw service from neighborhoods. We, instead of uh, two corruption scandals on the front page, it's far easier to leave a thousand crack houses in operation. And that has been the story of Philadelphia. And leaving those thousand crack houses in operation has, de has devastating impact on neighborhoods, and it has equally devastating impact on the morale inside police departments. And I think that sows the seeds for future police corruption. Demoralized cops are gonna be cops that feel like the system doesn't care. And I think the, uh, you know, the you need to build a system of accountability and delivery of service to neighborhoods if you want a, if you want to really fight corruption. But what's most important is that they are our only protection. The police officer is our only protection against a society that is extremely violent and uh, in many ways corrupt itself. So when there is a, a corrupt police officer, we in law enforcement have to react and react very vigorously. Because if we don't do that, if we, if, we, if, we, if we sort of say, well, you know, it's just another corrupt police officer, we'll get to that. If we don't react very vigorously, we're really removing the, the thin blue line uh, from, uh, that protects us from this violent society. Uh, and if we don't make an example of that, of that uh, corrupt police officer, we're almost, uh, we're almost allowing it to occur. We could turn this 
country, particularly some of our cities, into a third world country.